Good evening. It is, before we get started, it is my privilege tonight to introduce you to a book that many of us have been praying would come here, and it's eventually gotten here. I'm the only one that has a copy right now. But our beloved brother John McMurray, where are you? Is he hiding? He's in the back. And that's the proper way to say his name is John McMurray. Um, our brother, our beloved brother has finished his book. It's got a forward by Paul Young and an afterward by uh, Brad Jerzak and a blurb by a guy that's a genius uh, and, and really humble. But it's, the title of it is The Spiritual Evolution, Rediscovering the Greatest Story Ever Told. Uh, my translation of that is one man's escape from the insanity of religion into a stunned rediscovery of the presence, not absence of Jesus and who left us a book, but the presence of Jesus. So John has given us a map. If that's what you're after, and I think you all are, and many of you know uh, this book has been coming for a while, and I read it, and there's two or three insights in here that's pretty good. <laughs> um, I loved it, and I'm proud as I can be to be the one that gets to announce this to the world. I'm proud as I can be of, of John and proud for him and of him. So what I would like us to do is let's just, if you're comfortable doing this, and John is not, and this is going to be fun, but I want you to, to raise your hand and point back towards him. Holy Spirit, you have inspired this book, and we know that you have things, ways that you're opening doors. We ask you to open those doors and give John a platform, not just in Portland or even in the northwestern United States, but around the world, to proclaim this undiluted gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would protect his family in all of his travels. Amen. <laughs> I, this has been a long time coming. Okay. I've been told I cannot step beyond the two brass things, so we're going to have to do a little work. So let's, let's pray about tonight's lecture. Holy Spirit, everybody in this room wants to meet Jesus not as a doctrine, but as a person. And we want to meet him where we hurt because we want to be free. And that's your specialty and your delight to reveal Jesus, not simply to us, but in us. So we give you permission, Holy Spirit, to work behind our watchful dragons and our defenses and turn the lights on so that we can meet Jesus all over again and encounter him and in his face and through his eyes, see his father, our father, as he really is. Some of us need to have physical healing. All of us need to have uh, internal healing of our wounds and sorrows. We bring those to you, Holy Spirit. We ask you to reveal Jesus in us. In his name, amen. Hmm. The, the undiluted gospel, as I call it, the truth of all truths. When you hear it, it astonishes your heart. And it creates an ignited conversation. And when you don't hear it, and your heart's not astonished, you have to fake it. You have to pose. And if you grew up in, in situations like many of us have where you never have seen a, an astonished heart, you don't necessarily know what you're missing. But our brothers and sisters in the early church wrote about Jesus so that we could have 
an encounter with him that would blow our minds and astonish our hearts and create a conversation that's bigger than all of us. Now, my entire adult life, I didn't know this at the time, but I can see looking back, my job has been rediscover the gospel, rediscover what this is about. What was it that blew Paul's mind? What was it that captured John and Peter and sent them preaching and teaching, willing to sacrifice their lives? Of course, it was Jesus. We all know that. But somehow our vision of Jesus has become so watered down, we can talk about him and it doesn't do anything here. Are you kidding me? Saul of Tarsus, he's spitting nails. He's angry. He's got papers from the big boys. He's going to kill Christians and he gets stopped in his tracks and his entire world changes. And that man never once gave up after that. He saw something. He encountered something. And it wasn't a theology and it wasn't even news. It was a person. And he discovered him in the least likely place in the universe, inside of himself. Galatians chapter 1. When God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Now that's the astonished heart. That's the undiluted gospel. Jesus Christ is in you and you're in him. And he did that. Ask him if it's true. That's how easy it is. Ask him if it's true. So our brother John, the gospel writer, and Paul and Peter have left us stories and books so that we would not miss the point. And we've missed the point. And it's okay because we're right on schedule. And this is, this is coming from several different angles at once. We were told, I was told, as a matter of the heart of the gospel is that the human race is separated from God. Well, if you're separated from God, you've got to figure out a way back. Which one is going to be the right one? Most of you in this room, like me, have tried two or three or four different versions of how to get back. The blessed thing about where we are is we know they didn't work. They didn't astonish our heart. They didn't, where, where is the truth that sets us free? Where is this joy unspeakable full of glory that Peter talked about? Are these just terms? No. We were told we're separated from God, which the, is the, the ultimate fundamental lie in this universe. And we have bought into somebody else's idea of how to get back. And no matter which way it is, it always comes back to you. You have to do something to get across the divide. And even in Protestantism, when we talk about it's faith alone, even then it's still my faith. And honestly, I just buried my dad in March. He, was, he had uh, Lewy bodies and Parkinsonians. And I sat there for three years walking with my dad, and I thought, you know, what a load of rubbish. It's the message of the Bible. Dad, you got to hold on. You can't lose your faith now. It's all about you. You got to have faith, Dad. Hang in there. Memorize some more, but he's losing his mind. The gospel's not the news that my dad can hold on by faith. The gospel is the news that Jesus has hold of my dad. And you, and me. And so we're not supposed to make something up to believe. We're supposed to believe we're included. That Jesus did it. And we can rest. And you go, are you kidding me, Jesus? I'm in? Of course you're in. In fact, Baxter, you've never been out anywhere except here. And you spent probably 50 years of life trying to get into something you're born into. That's called <laughs> family embarrassment. You know, when you do something stupid and your family loves to remind you every time they get together for the rest of your life. Many of us have spent a lot of years trying to get there you're trying to get there because you were told you weren't. I'm telling you, you are. Believe it. Rest in it. And I want to show you how John, in his gospel, how he understands the nature of the problem of the human race and how Jesus Christ is the Father's solution. And I want you to see this in the text of John because it's been there for 2,000 years. But most of us have come at the story from a different way that John does, and we skip right over some of these most amazing statements. I mean, the first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was 
with God. He was in the beginning with God. He was fully God. You know, I went back to check on a bunch of different translations in John because I expected John to say, in the beginning, God was holy and humanity failed and someone had to pay. So Jesus had come and paid for us. I mean, I mean, where is that? Where is that scenario laid out for us that way? I want you to see what John the Apostle puts first, not second, not third, not fourth, first. And he never leaves the theme. Not one second does he leave the theme all the way through his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with the Father. What The Word is with God, and the Word it was God. Many of you have seen me do this illustration, but I want to deepen it. The word translated with in our English Bibles, pros, in the Greek, means to be turned towards. It means to be face to face. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was turned toward face to face the Father. Are you kidding me? Why haven't we been talking about this for 2,000 years? How, how have we even gotten beyond those first verses? This is the most astonishing thing in the universe. In the beginning, before creation, was the Word. He was there. Not just beside the Father, not on a little chair beneath Him. He was turned toward face to face with the Father Himself. John says, this is where you start. This is where you begin. This is the truth. He's not a Western Christian. He's a disciple of Jesus. He's an apostle. He's telling you, in the beginning, this is the beginning of the story. In the beginning was the Word, the Son, whom He was turned toward His Father face to face. And John is going to bring us to understand more than anyone in the New Testament, this person, the Holy Spirit. But tonight, I want to focus here. And I want to show you how John understands who we are, what happened to us, and how Jesus is the solution. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is face to face with the Father. And then he says... All things came into being in that person. Not one thing came into being. He's, he's getting a prophetic word there. He's looking down through American history. He's realizing we're going to have to cut this, nip this in the bud, as Barney Fife would say, nip it. This idea of separation that you were told is the truth about the human race in the third verse of John's Gospel it is obliterated. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is face to face with God. All things came into being through Him, and not one thing came into being apart from Him. You see, this idea of separation may make sense to us because of the, of the influence of Greek philosophy on our minds, but John is not starting with separation. John starts with face to faceness and the fact that we're included in this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is face to face with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being. Write your name there. Write it. I came into being in Jesus. I've never been separated from Jesus. You haven't either. Neither has anybody else. Now we're beginning to think like a Christian. Now we're beginning to think, well, maybe the problem here is not that I'm no good. Maybe the problem is I have no clue who I am. Maybe there's this thing called darkness. And maybe the light is shining in the darkness and the darkness doesn't understand it. You see how John's thinking? Relationship, face-to-faceness, other-centered, love, care, not hierarchical, relational, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All things came into being through this one. And apart from Him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. You will never go anywhere on earth or even if you get in a spaceship and go to the far corners of the universe and meet anything that got here and stays here in any way apart that, that, excuse me, through Jesus. Nothing. All things came into being through Him. In Him was life. And that life was the light of man, the light of humanity. In Him was life. Now let me ask you a question. Based on the first three verses of John's Gospel, what would you say is the light? In the beginning was the Word, the Son, Jesus, face to face with the Father. 
in this fellowship, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't understand. What is the light? I'm going to make you think with me. What is the light based on the first three verses? Is Jesus the light? I mean, you, you know we're all supposed to say, yeah, Jesus is the light. But, but is, isn't there a little bit more to it than that? Which Jesus? Which Jesus? Tell me about this Jesus based on the first two verses of John's gospel. Is he alone? He's in relationship. So the light is Jesus in his relationship with his Father. And what else? Holy Spirit. And what else? Us. So the light of life is Jesus' relationship with his Father and the Holy Spirit and our inclusion in him. Well, guess what the darkness is then? The, the darkness is the delusion that keeps you from being able to see that this is the, the core of the universe, the father-son relationship, and our inclusion in it is the light. Anything that blinds us to this reality is the darkness. And what's interesting, and John, he's telling us this in the first four verses, five verses. And what's interesting is he calls it the darkness. And I grew up hearing that darkness is just the absence of light. It's not just the absence of light. The darkness does not understand. Now, whatever he means by the darkness, it's supposed to think. It has intentionality. One way of translating that verse is that the darkness not only doesn't understand, but it's not able to overcome. There is an aggression here. There is intent here. So there's the problem. Here's the truth. Here's the real world. Everything is coming to being in this relationship. You have, I have, and we've been lied to and deceived about this relationship and about our identity. And when you are lied to about who you are, who God is, you don't see what he is, you have to create something that you can see. You with me? And then you have to defend it with a vengeance because it's all, all that you think you have. All the time, all the time, you're sitting right here included in this relationship, created in this relationship. The darkness is we can't see who we are, and so we we've got to create something that we can see. And wonderfully now, wonderfully right across this world, right across the United States, wonderfully all these things that we have created that we're calling church and kingdom and glorious life, these things have bored us to tears because they're empty. And now the Holy Spirit's turning lights on again. It's like, oh my goodness me. The darkness is anything that blinds you and me from this relationship. Anything that blinds you and me from seeing that this relationship is the foundation and fundamental to everything in the universe. I don't care if it's religious. It doesn't matter. The darkness is anything that keeps us from seeing this relationship and our inclusion in it. Now, how bizarre is that? How bizarre is it when you're looking on 2,000 years of Western Christian history and we haven't been talking about this relationship. Well, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about being separated from God and trying to get back and building empires to prove to everyone around us that our way is working because God's blessing us. Well, we might as well go on and be embarrassed now. This is the truth. Now, I want you to see this. Verse 6, there was a man sent out from the presence of God. His name was John. He was not the light because this is the light and our inclusion in it. Or if you want me to give you another verse, here is the light. Here is the truth. John 14, 20. Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. That's the truth that sets you free. That's the light. The darkness is anything that blinds us to those realities. Anything blinds us to that right there. And John is setting up his gospel and he's going he's to pull the string and you're going to get to see Jesus in a way that very few of us have, have to this point ever gotten a chance to see. The darkness is anything that's opposed. Uh, John the Baptist is sent 
out from the presence of God. He was not the light. He was sent to bear witness to the light because in this world, in this creation, once Adam and Eve were called into being, once we were here, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not going to do anything without our participation because that would be to pretend that we're not real and that we're not right here. So he calls out, who will go? This is Isaiah. Who will go? Who can I send? Who will go for us? John the Baptist says, I'm in. I'll go and I'll bear witness to the light because the darkness is so profound. Even when the light is present, it needs someone to bear witness to it. And then he says, listen, There was the true light, verse 9, which coming into the world enlightens everyone. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Where was the light? Where was this relationship? Did you hear it? I always think of God as a spectator, watching from a distance. It says here that he, the light, the Father, Son, the Creator and Sustainer of all things, is in the world. And although the world was made through and in Him, the world did not know Him. And in verse 11, He came to His own, and those who were His own received Him not. You see, verse 11, the receiving not is getting a little bit closer to the, the darkness did not overcome it. There's some kind of aggression that's going on here. Now, John does not spend a lot of time as a philosophical theologian uh, trying to, to deal with the problem of evil, he wants us to see what's going on because he's so excited about the genius of God and how he goes about uh, fixing it. So let me skip over to chapter 3. I want you to see this, and then we'll, we'll go to chapter 5. But um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the judgment, that the light is come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. Now, I, I want to ask you a question. Is this the conclusion of the story? And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light and were unwilling to come to the light. Is this the end of the story? Because I'm, it's really interesting. How many sermons have you heard? Jesus laid down his life for you and you're not willing. You hate the light. Unwilling to come to the light. This all gets ratcheted up in John chapter 5. And... Um, I want to read these verses and pay attention. Listen carefully. If you want to know what happened in the fall of Adam, this is Jesus' interpretation, what I'm about to read to you. John um, <clears throat> 5, 36, 37 and following. And the Father who sent me has borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, and you do not have his word abiding in your heart. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is these that bear witness of me, and you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from, my, from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in your heart. And I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the one and true God? You see, it's almost like... Jesus is saying, well, I came, I'm the light, I'm here, and you didn't want me. Dad, I laid down my life for him, and you vindicated me by resurrecting me in the Holy Spirit, but they didn't want me. And I'm like, well, maybe we need to retitle this book. It's not the gospel, it's, it's how the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did win, in fact. It just was unwilling to come to the light. You feel that? You feel it? This is where we've been stuck. Maybe 
Maybe John is a, is a proto-Calvinist. And maybe what he's doing here is he's, he's telling, Jesus is saying, guys, there's two groups in all eternity. This group over here, non-elect, not loved by my Father, never going to be loved. I didn't come for them. This group over here, elect, loved by my Father. I've come to them. They are my sheep, and my sheep hear my voice. Sorry, dudes. You just happen to be in the wrong group. I'm just giving you a heads up. You have never heard my Father's voice. You have never seen his form ever. You do not have his word abiding in your heart. You do not have his love in you. You with me? Sorry. Schooler. I love it. Listen. Listen to this. You do not have the love of my Father in your heart. Listen to this. Father, I have made you known to those who do not have never seen your voice, seen your form or heard your voice, and do not have your word abiding. It says, I have made you known and I will make it known in order that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. You see, we either read John 5 as a conclusion. Jesus came, he died, he Lay down his life for us and you're unwilling to come and that's just too bad. Off to the rotisserie. We believe that the human obstinance can overcome the heart of the Father, Son, and Spirit. You know what I'm saying? There's no power in a message like that. There's no power in a message like that. How about this? Let's say that this group of people here is the Sanhedrin, John 5. And let's say, let's say Saul of Tarsus is the main, he's the main ringleader. He's standing right here. And Jesus comes up and says, Saul, you have never heard the voice of God. I'll give you a heads up. The hour's coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and come to life. It's giving you... You have never heard the voice of God. You've never seen his form and you do not have his word abiding in your heart. And you can see. You know, it's this brewing anger in Saul and in the leadership as Jesus is, is blowing their cover and you do not have the love of my father in your heart. And then imagine Jesus standing there in front of those men saying, listen guys, I am not a prophet who has come to argue with you. I am not a prophet who has come to point out where you're wrong. I am the word of God and I will make my way inside of your darkness and you will see what I see and feel what I feel and know what I know when I hear my father say, you are my beloved in whom my soul delights. I am not a prophet. I am the love of the father coming to the far country and I will find a way inside. You can almost feel him it's like a little apostolic swagger of a grin, like you maybe even a wink if Saul. Give me three days, dude. We're gonna have an entirely different kind of conversation. Now, let me show you. I have made you known, Father, and I will make you known. And I love that. I, I just especially in the in the rawness of the last several months with me and my dad, my, Jesus is saying, Baxter, I take responsibility for finding your father in his darkness. I have made my father known and I will. And he's telling us what he's fixing to go and do on the cross. He's going to find his way inside the belly of the beast. I have made you known and I will make it known in order that the love those who do not have the love of God in their hearts, I'm coming in order that the love with which you love me, Father, from before the foundation of the world, that love may be in them and I in them as the one anointed in the Holy Spirit. Now, how is he going to do that? Is he going to get into a theological argument with them? How is he going to do it? Notice the next verse. When Jesus had spoken these words, he proceeded forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kindron where there was a garden into which he himself entered and his disciples. Now, Judas, also who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas, then having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, 
came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered and said, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am. And Judas, who was betraying him, was standing with him. When therefore he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. You see how John's mind is working? He's like, dudes, there's this thing called craziness going on. And you've got God the Father completely backwards. And you've defined sin in such a way that has nothing to do with the father-son relationship and nothing to do with your inclusion in it. It's some kind of moral thing. Sin is blindness to what is. And Jesus is going to find his way inside our blindness so he can turn the lights on for us. Athanasius, one of the early church fathers, he wrote this, and this is one of the things that sent me on my way 30-something years ago. What then is God being good to do when his creation is on the road to ruin? And in another book, he said, the God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. Let me translate that through the prologue of John. What then is the bridegroom to do when his bride that he created and holds together and sustains has so lost her mind and prostituted herself with all forms of idolatry that she runs from him and does not want to come to him? What then is this bridegroom to do? And John's argument in the prologue is, and so, you listening to me? And so the word became flesh. He's going to find his way inside his bride's blindness and the darkness. How is he going to do that? We just read what John is saying. Jesus, Father, I made you known. I'm going to make you known. But when he spoke those words, he proceeded forth. And there coming down the valley is Judas. And one of the most bizarre scenes in biblical history. Roman soldiers and temple police from the Jews and the Pharisees. Did that not strike you as being a bit bizarre? Where, where is that in the book? The Jews hated the Romans. Romans thought the Jews were nothing. Weren't worth their time. And here, you're looking down a valley. Father, I have made you known. And they're coming. 600 to 1,000 armed Roman soldiers with lanterns and torches and weapons. You see the image? That's what John wants you to see. He wants you to feel the ground vibrating. Those soldiers coming down and see the fire and the smoke and the glistening off of the shields and the spears. He wants you to feel this, this is empire. And then you got the Jewish temple police, and John doesn't tell us the number there, but Mark says there was a multitude then. The temple police were the Sanhedrin's uh, henchmen. They made sure everything got done, if you know what I mean. And they're coming, and they're is Judas leading them. And Jesus steps forward. And I can only imagine the look on Jesus' face at Judas. I can't imagine. But it wouldn't be surprising to me if he didn't say something like this. Judas, I accept your betrayal of me and I will use it to save the human race. How about, how about that? Who saw this one coming? This is what John is telling us. This circle of life created us to be in the middle of it, and they're not going to have it any other way. They don't do abandonment. But how do you get inside of someone who doesn't want to be with you? How do you get inside of a problem when they're blind and they can't see? They don't know that they're blind. Jesus is standing there, and all of a sudden, he says, they say, whom, whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus the Nazarene, because nothing good can come from Nazareth. Jesus the Nazarene, and he says, I am. Ego I me. The name of God. I don't think he screamed it. I would have been screaming it because I didn't believe it. But I think Jesus just said, Ego I me, I am. And 600 to 1,000 Roman soldiers armed fall on the ground. Judas falls on the ground. The temple police fall on the ground. And I can just, I can see Peter. Can't you just see him? He, Barney Fife, yeah, we got you now, Lord. You know. 
Mm -hmm. And then the most bizarre thing happens. Just in a few verses it says, so the Roman cohort and the commander, which is the commander of 1,000, and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. So how do you go from I am and everybody, empire, religion, betrayal, falls out to a few verses later, they bind Jesus and take him off to be brutalized. Why is John, what is John trying to help you to see? What does he want you, you see, he wants your heart astonished. Jesus is saying, John is telling this story so we will know this. Jesus is saying to these men and to the, the armed soldiers, you need to understand that your murderous mission will only be fulfilled by my permission. My permission. Just understand how this works. And I am going to submit myself to you. Brothers and sisters, what goes on on Calvary is not sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's the Son of the Father and the Creator of all things submitting Himself to the hands of angry sinners. And he is going to allow us to damn him and to curse him and to spit upon him and mock him while we are breathing Christological air. Where our entire being depends upon his grace and goodness holding us together while we're acting the fool. And not only are we going to spit on him, we're going to beat him. And those lashes, you know, we read the story. 39 lashes was considered... Um, one short of lethal by the Jews. And I was reading the other days that the Romans didn't have that rule. They didn't count. We don't know who was doing the whipping here, but we know 39 lashes after those, those uh, strips come with metal and bit and come all the way around Jesus. And when they take it, it's taking flesh. And you do that 39 times, you're looking at kidneys. You're looking at lungs. You're looking at a man who's bleeding out and is in complete shock. And then they take the crown of thorns and mash it on his head in mockery. You see, if this whole thing was about somehow Jesus suffering the wrath of God, why does he have to go through all of that? Just put him on the cross and let God pour out the wrath on him. That's not what the story's about. The story is about my bride who's lost her mind. And I've tried to talk to her. I've sent her prophet after prophet and she doesn't want to hear. So I've got to find a way to show her i got to get inside, and the only way to get inside is to submit myself to them in their darkness, in their insanity, in their delusion. And I'm going to go to the very bottom because I do not want any fragment left behind. I'm going to go to the place where I cannot see. I cannot see my Father's face. I cannot feel the Holy Spirit's presence. I'm going to that place where there is no love of God in the human heart. I'm going to that place, Jesus is saying, I'm going to get there by submitting myself to you and let you torture me and brutalize me. And there, I'm going to trust my Father. There, I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pitch our tent in the place of your unbelief. We're going to pitch our tent in the place of your apostasy. And then Jesus is coming back to life. And in Saul of Tarsus, it's time now for us to have a new conversation. The lights go on. Saul does not meet Jesus externally. Jesus doesn't come with a scroll to have a theological argument. He shows up inside his darkness. It takes his breath away. It astonishes his heart. It ignites the conversation. And the brother never shut up until they killed him. You see, this is about love. This is about a love story where the Father, Son, and Spirit said, not on my watch, not on my watch. We did not create you to perish. We did not create you to be blind and not be able to see or feel. So we're going to go to the pit and we're going to get there by submitting ourselves to you. The hours come, Jesus says, and now is when you, disciples, will be scattered and each one of you will go to your own home. But I am not alone. For my Father is with me. Meta, union with me. Where was God on the cross? God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the cosmos, finding his way inside the darkness. And we've separated all this mess out, and no wonder we're not astonished. 
It's not good enough for Jesus to say, you don't have the love of my Father in your heart. He says, I, I'm going to come deal with this. I'm going to do what only I can do as the Son of God. And let's find you in your darkness. This is what John is telling us. And you can, you can feel his, his, I feel it anyway. John sort of, he's trembling because he's remembering the horror of it. But there's that little grin. Like, this is the coolest thing. And even nobody saw this coming. Not a single person saw it. Isaiah got a glimpse of it. Maybe Ezekiel. But this is what it means when God says, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. And when I come to save the human race, I'm going to do it in a way that you don't even see it happening. In fact, you're thinking you're winning. Is it not astounding? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was face to face with the Father. All things came into being in Him. Apart from Him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. And then this darkness arises that blinds us to who we are, and off we go creating religion after religion after religion to try to get back to a God that has never been separated from us. And so Jesus says, that's not good enough. I'm going to send prophet. They kill the prophet. I'll send another. They kill him. Again and again and again, you run into this human obstinance and rebellion and unwillingness. So Jesus says, I'm going to become flesh. I'm going to get inside, and I'm going to do that by submitting myself to them and let them brutalize me. And the Holy Spirit says, this just... When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am. Here's the covenant. The Lord, Israel, I will be your God, you will be my people. That failed. I am going to find a way to put my spirit in you. I am going to find a way to put my ways on your heart. And you see this, this biblical moment where the human race comes together in the figure of, of Judas and in the figure of Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the only high priest in Israel's history that actually ever did his job. He offered up the one true sacrifice. And he did it for the wrong reason. And he didn't know what he did. You see, when Jesus says, when you lift up the Son of Man, the human race as one person is saying, this is our response, Father. We damned your Son, we cursed Him, we spit on Him, and now we're offering Him back to you. And Papa says, I will, I will accept that. I will accept that your crucifix to my son, and I will embrace you there and endure you there with everlasting mercy. And this is the new covenant. This is the new covenant. Your contribution, my contribution was not faith. It's not faithfulness. It was treachery. Our apostasy crucified the son and Papa took it and said, I will embrace you there. Now there's no way that you can be separated from me because I've accepted you at your very most violent worst. And we got all these preachers going all over the country, telling everybody, it's about faith, it's about faith. Yes, it's about faith. It's about the faithfulness of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and our faithless, faithlessness, and how they embrace us there. And Jesus says, now I'm going to turn the lights on. You want to believe? This is what you believe in. You believe in this Jesus who's found you. You believe that Jesus has embraced you at your very worst. And he's used your treachery and my apostasy as the glue to hold me in this relationship. You know what happens when you begin to hear that inside? I can see it on your faces. What? That's like the coolest thing. It can't be true. Man, if that's true, whew, what have we been doing all of our lives? Family embarrassment's coming. Jesus did not count on Baxter to be faithful. He counted on me to be an apostate. And he embraced me there. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, how about I accompany Jesus as he suffers from your apostasy and I, I build my temple where I dwell with all of my creativity in that dark place inside of you. How about that? You see, we don't believe to get in. We believe that they found us. And when you believe that they found us and have hold of us, then you have something to say to every broken person on planet Earth. You have something to say to every nursing home. 
You have something to say to every person who's going through trials and tribulations and struggles and sorrows and sadness. You tell them to believe in this Jesus, the one who has them, has hold of them and will never let them go. The one who laid down his life to get inside the darkness so the lights are coming on. And let me tell you, this is the future. We will preach the gospel, this gospel of this Jesus. He is in you. You're in him, in the Father, in the Holy Spirit. He did that. Ask him, is it true? Ask Jesus, are you in me, Jesus? And let me tell you, what do you think is going to happen inside your broken heart when you actually hear Jesus himself say, I am? I mean, for real. That's where we're going. We're going to get to live from his I am as children of the Father with Jesus inside the darkness. And then the light's going to be shining out of us. That's where we're headed. And the reason I know that is because there's no way this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are going to give up until the blessing that they have determined to pour forth on us and bring us to experience is accomplished. And, and the whole earth will be full. How much time do I have, Ernie? Two minutes? Two-minute drill. Let's just close our eyes just a second. And everybody be as still as you possibly can be. I want you to ask Jesus a couple of questions. Jesus, are you in me? Jesus, where is your father? Jesus, where is the Holy Spirit? Jesus, can your father be trusted? And then ask this question. Jesus, does, does your father have hold of you? Does he abandon you? Are you afraid, Jesus, of your father turning his back on you? I can hear Jesus saying, Baxter, I'm not afraid of that because I've been down to the deepest, darkest pit in the entire cosmos and my father never once turned his back on me and the Holy Spirit never abandoned me, but they let me go to that place where I couldn't feel him and I knew I could trust him. I've been that place, Baxter. And I know my father doesn't do abandonment and you're in me and I'm in the father, in the Holy Spirit. So maybe, maybe you can rest. It's okay if you spend the next 50 years just resting right there. Just marveling. You don't have to do anything. You don't want to. Hmm. I have a suspicion when you meet that father and that son and that Holy Spirit on the inside, there's this thing called the great dance. Amen. Thank you.